Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Nick Davenport, aka Mr. Mental Muscle, and we have another episode today on the Mental Breakdown channel. Now, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. We try to bring you a different style of psychological concepts, whether it be on current events, different topics, creative videos, you name it. I just want to teach you different things so you can get your mind right. But today, we're going to do a QA. I do these every few months or so. I put posts on my Instagram at Mr. Mental Muscle, and I see what the feedback we get, and then I answer the questions and try to see if I can give you some info. So let's get into it. So the first question we have, what is your favorite sport to watch? So this is more about me. So I have to think too deep on that, but I probably will because I overthink everything, right? So basically, I don't have a favorite sport. I grew up playing baseball from probably four or five years old all the way up until high school. And then I stopped. I tried out for my college baseball team just for fun to see how I would do. Didn't do that great being out of sport for a while. But um, basically track and football were my primary sports from middle school on. And I actually went to college primarily for track. So I always enjoyed watching those sports, track, football, and baseball throughout my childhood up until probably mid-college. And once I got to college, I didn't really care as much because being a high-level competitor, I, I wanted to beat these guys. I used to be, I admired them, now I wanted to beat them. You know, your, your heroes become your adversaries, that, that kind of thing, right? So basically as an adult, I would say I'm pretty sport agnostic. Shout out to my guy, Justin Sewell. He, he said that term, and I love it, because I don't have a favorite, but I would say I primarily see a lot of uh, MMA, primarily UFC, because I have a few clients that fight in the UFC that I watch all their fights. So shouts out to them. But basically, I would say my favorite by default, if that's an answer, is MMA, primarily watching the UFC. What are the biological factors of depression? So depression, right? So depression gets used a lot. It's probably the most common mental illness that people will incur and probably the most talked about in the word itself, depress, doesn't necessarily mean you have to be clinically depressed, but it definitely means there's a decrease in your mood. Something gets lowered, like you talk about a depression in another context. So in psychology, a lower mood, right? So depression, I think in general, is just someone who has a tough time they're dealing with. They're not as elated as usually are on things they typically would be interested in. So in general, we deal with it day to day in a dynamic and subclinical way. But far as like just the aspect, the biological aspects, people talk a lot about the um, serotonin levels, dopamine. So neurochemicals, right? We talk about dopamine. That's actually the motivation to want to do something and the reward to keep doing it again. And that loop keeps you going to embark on said behaviors that you get joy out of, right? Or serotonin, regulating your mood. So you can look at it like, okay, if these are out of whack, is that the reason we get depressed? And there's actually studies coming out saying that that's not necessarily the full story, I should say. There's a lot more to that. But it's interesting, I've seen research from an evolutionary psychological standpoint that makes a lot of sense, and I'll talk about that. But um, basically, there's some evolutionary traits. You can see depression made sense, but it's like we don't do it the same way that our ancient ancestors used to do it. So for example, let's go back, say 2000 plus years. If you were in your tribe, you're moving around trying to find food, foraging, and you got you know, lower mood, you weren't feeling yourself, you would go to your corner and kind of isolate from the group and try to figure it out and get yourself back on so you can go back and contribute back to society. Because back then, being a loner wasn't very, it happened, obviously, there was hermits and people who stayed to themselves, but it wasn't high for survival. And back then, it was all about existing in society because we didn't have like social media so we could just expand any way we want. We had to do with the people right in front of us. So we could just blow people off like that. So it was like, okay, I'm in a lower mood. I don't really feel like myself. I'm not embarking on the activities I typically like to do, but I'm going to figure out, okay, I need to take some time, get it together, and then come back. So it makes sense because that can contribute you to recovery from a mental standpoint so you can get better. Just like with physical, if you break your leg, right, you would sit out for X amount of weeks until the bone healed. And once it healed, you would get better, train it, and then get back out there. And it's the same thing with your mind. But I think nowadays what's changed is when we go to that corner to get away and isolate, we kind of stay there. Even if we physically come back, we mentally stay there. And that takes away because we can be way more isolated than we were not even just thousands of years ago, just even a hundred years ago because how society has evolved. And I always say the term no more saber tooth tigers is like a foot race with the brain, the body and society. And the brain and body are still like right here, but society has taken off leaks and bounds. 
and we're trying to catch up to it. So with depression, I could say that evolutionary aspects makes a lot of sense because like anything, you need that time off. You can't always be a lady. You can't always be go, go, go. Sometimes you have to take that time off and figure out what's wrong, be sad, but you would recalibrate and come back. And I think we don't do that as a lot as we should. All right, so this last one says, how to control emotionality with social media having a large effect on teens? Wow, another good question. So emotionality, so when we talk about that term, this is someone who tends to get worried, anxious, they don't cope with stress well, they, they're more fearful, uh, they get predictive of the negative outcomes way more than they would see the positive outcomes. So when he says how that can affect you know, teens and then you bring in social media, so there's a term called parasocial relationships. So when you think it's about the term para, so it's not a direct social relationship, it's kind of adjacent to it. So think about it, we can meet people all over the world without ever seeing them in real life. I actually have clients that I've never physically met, but I've worked with for years. And that seems crazy, but that's how we operate. And it's not a bad thing. It's actually pretty cool because think about what I said about the depression thing. Uh, imagine that you can reach out to someone, even though you don't know them personally, you get that connection that can actually help you. So it definitely has a lot of positive implications, but with everything, there's a up and a downside. There's two sides of every coin, right? So I think that the negative side could be that with these parasocial relationships, we assume a lot more connection than we really have. And we can't really form real deep bonds sometimes because we put more emphasis on relationships that may have not even really been there or since you communicate with someone on social media you think you know them and then when they don't fulfill their side now you feel let down and that's not a good thing and you can even extend that even further it's like say famous people celebrities when they form these parasocial relationships they'll never probably talk to or meet these people but you look up to them they live a, a life that you can vicariously attend to and that's good because you want to have goals and dream big but what happens is you set the standard, this outcome that you're probably not going to fulfill. You're going to get here, but your outcome's up here. And like with dopamine, I talked about it in the previous question, your brain gets wired for wanting to continue to be motivated to do these action based on that dopaminergic uh, process. But the thing is, if you're not getting the reward, your brain's going to start saying, maybe we should cease doing this. And that's where that, that, that anxiety, that worry, that trouble comes in. And you have all these unrealistic standards and people are comparing their highlight reels when in real life, most people aren't going to show their bad. And the thing is, if they do show their bad, they're kind of glorifying it. I, I see videos with people crying in their car and I'm not doubting that if that's what you do, it is what it is, but it's like, when people are dealing with this stuff and they see that, it might diminish, I guess, the capacity of how deep emotions can go. Because now you're just a person on a screen. And how much can really go into that when they think, hmm, they're just on the screen crying. It's not that big a deal. I can cry. I can worry. Fine. But then it gets to the point where does it mean anything? And that's where we, I think we missed the mark. So social media has, I guess, a lot of impact on all of our lives, not just teens. I can admit that I'm 34, so I didn't grow up in it. But I transitioned to adulthood right when social media became a big thing. It was around, obviously, when I was a kid, like teen years, but it didn't become like a big thing until I was in my early 20s. So I was fortunate enough that I was forming real relationships. So I think the biggest takeaway is it, it's limiting how we can really get to know each other. And I can even go into like mating and dating, which is a whole other topic. So I'll leave it at that. But all right, guys, that was great. It was a quick q and I didn't have a lot of questions this time around, but I love talking about these topics. So if you have any other questions, leave them in the comments below. Maybe I'll make a whole video topic out of those. So let me know. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe to the video, share it if you like what you heard. And as always, get your mind right.